morning everyone today is june 23rd it's tuesday and our passage for today is first corinthians 14 20 to 40 and so this is the word of the lord it says brothers and sisters stop thinking like children in regard to evil be infants but in your thinking be adults in the law it is written with other tongues and through the lips of foreigners i will speak to this people but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers, but for believers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquires or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all. As the secrets of their hearts are laid bare, so they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word or instruction of revelation, a tongue or interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue or two, or at the most three, should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop, for you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of the prophets, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for women to speak in the church. Or did the word of God originate with you, or are you the only one? Only people it has reached. If anyone thinks they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit, let them acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the, the Lord's command. But if anyone ignores this, they will themselves be ignored. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Do not forbid it, speaking in tongues, but everything should be done lifted in a fitting and orderly way. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this time as we gather again this week. It's a new week, Father, to... Uh, continue to walk in your graces and with every day that passes and every week that passes lord even though the burdens may rise lord we know that the grace is given to us each day to meet the needs of the day and so lord as we dive into your word holy spirit give us uh, wisdom and understanding and more importantly the the conviction to act upon the words that we hear in jesus name i pray amen all right guys now this is a passage that, if not taken carefully, can be very divisive and can really be misinterpreted and used in the wrong way. And I want to flat out say from the beginning that this passage is not anti-women. Uh, because if you look toward the end, it says that women shouldn't speak in the church. In the English, that is very is a very simplified version of what Paul is trying to say because Paul is actually not against women leading. He's not against women prophesying. If you look earlier in the letter, you it is very Paul very much expects women to prophesy. He very much expects women to uh, lead and participate in church activities and growth, the growing of the kingdom. But traditionally and historically, this passage has been used to pretty much oppress um, the, the women in our church and, and just society in general. And that's not right. That's not correct. Because God has created everyone in the image of God. And therefore everyone has, uh, equal value and worth. Um, though we may have different tasks and callings, um, in terms of building the kingdom, women are just as powerfully led by the spirit as, as men. But we have to look at the totality of today's passage and what's been going on for 14 chapters. For 14 chapters, Paul has been doing his best to remind them of the, the basis of the faith. He's reminding them that even though they're spiritually gifted, they are very divided. And that is 
and that's anti-gospel. And so if we take this past passage in face value, we are pretty much going against the very goal and purpose of what Paul's trying to do in this letter to the Corinthians is to unite them in the gospel. And so uh, if I were to summarize kind of like the, the, the whole thing about today's passage is about orderly worship. What is the proper and orderly set of worship and how can we be united as a whole? Right? And so if you, if you look at today's passage, let's look at verse 22. Because 22 and 20, 20 to 25, is, it can be very confusing. If not, if you read it very, it can sound contradictory. Like Paul seems to contradict himself as you go from 22 to 23 and he goes to uh, 24. It may seem like Paul just contradicted himself. But it's just a, the English variation of what he's saying is very confusing the way it's ordered and written and translated because... And you might ask yourself, why does that constantly seem to be the case? Is because you know there's a lot, there's a phrase, uh, lost in translation, and it's not just in regards to Bible, but just anything that we translate from language to language. There are certain words or phrases or meanings that not necessarily gets translated into the into another language well, if sometimes at all. And the Bible again is not written originally in English. Uh, especially New, Te New Testament and Old Testament, the New Testament was written in Greek, right? And therefore, ancient Greek that's not even alive right now. It's, a, it's not the it's not the modern day Greek. It's a different version of it. And when scholars are translating it to English, there's some things that get lost in translation. Also, cultural things that haven't translated well into the modern day. And so, when you look at verse twenty two, says. Tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers, for believers. Now, it may seem in verse 22 that it says tongues or the gift of tongues is not for believers, meaning it's not for believers to do, whereas prophecy is for the believers. But if you go down... Um, and you keep reading, and Paul talks about this. If you're having service and a non believer comes in and they hear all of your, everyone speaking in tongues, like everyone, like ecstatically speaking in tongues, he says, wouldn't they believe that you are a cult? And he goes on long to say, he says, as you go further, he keeps talking about, but if everyone was prophesying in the language that everyone understood, that the, the the presence of God will be so evident that non-believers will come to faith. So what's going on? What it seems that seems if you take it literally and word for word, it may seem like oh that seems like a contradictory, contradictory statement. And even for me, I had a hard time reconciling this at first because I was I was kind of confused. Like, what's going on right here? But then after think after just reading it over and over remember and that's the thing it's another side note again if you don't understand something and I said this before not to just gloss it over and move for keep moving forward um, but come back to it sit down with it read it over and just contemplate it like why does it seem like it's contradictory what is going on what has it been saying what is what are some things that I may not understand that make it me seem or believe that is contradictory and let the Spirit of God, like, unravel the text for you. Because it's the Spirit of God that gives you understanding and conviction to apply, right? So in verse 22, uh, so what the, what the cultural background is going on is this. At the, so Cor the, the city of Corinth, which, which the Corinthian church is located, is filled with many different types of religions, a lot of spiritual religions. A lot of cults, and it's filled with all these all these different cultural cultures merging into one location. It was a very it was like people say that it's like the modern day. It would be the equivalent to the modern day like New York or any huge city where there's a lot of money, a lot of a lot of influence, um, and a lot of ideas and 
cultures just meshing as one, one place. And that's what Corinth was. So if anything, modern day society looks, in terms of the Western society, looks or whatever society that's uh, first world, that is what um, the Corinthian church lived in very similarly, right? And so when you see these, see this cultural climate, there was a lot of cults that show their spirituality by speaking in tongues. I mean, they, they will be muttering, um, they will be screaming, being ecstatic, very expressive. And that's what was the religion of the day, right? Over the, the characteristic. And Christianity at this time is very new. It's still very new onto the scene of the, the world. Uh, Christianity, at least, right? And in the beginning phases of the church, they were facing a problem where they were forging their unique identity away from Judaism, because that's where it came from, right? But at the same time, as this religion of Christianity is new onto the scene, as rising in popularity, they didn't want to be associated or misunderstood as other cult religions, right? They said they didn't want to have their services be so reflective of the world that the Christian identity gets lost in the way in the process, and people say, "Oh, you're just, you're just another maybe maybe you're just another version of that cult religion," and then Paul is saying, "No, no, no, no," and so therefore he's instructing the Corinthians not to. He's not saying don't speak in tongues, but find the proper place and realize that it's not about your external expression of spirituality that it's going to be about your faith. But it's about your belief in the gospel. And that's what he's been trying to teach them, right? This whole 14 chapters. And so he says, when he says tongues then are assigned not for believers, but for unbelievers, what he's saying is this ecstatic, just um, wild, screaming, unintelligible, ununderstandable language, that is more reflective of earthly religion than the kingdom of God. Again, he's not talking against speaking in tongues, because that's genuine and true. But the belief that true spirituality is you being crazy and ecstatic, that's not what he's trying to, that's what he's saying. That's not for believers. Believers are to be people who hear from God and speak the things of God. And that God is the God of order. Again, we're not coming against the gift of tongues. That is true. That is real. Because at the end, Paul even says, don't forbid anyone from speaking in tongues. But what he's forbidding is this belief that spiritual ecstatic or like super excited behavior that is screaming and all that stuff. That is not the point of Christianity, the point of Jesus. The point of Christianity is not religious ritual. It is relationship with Jesus Christ. And so be reflective of that. And one way you show that you have... A living and active relationship with God is when you prophesy the words and things of God to the people, right? And so that's why if you keep going down in today's passage, one of the key emphasis, if you look at verse 23 or 25, uh, Paul is emphasizing the in in public worship the idea that Prophecy is prior, one of the most biggest priorities uh, because, one, people can understand it, and two, it shows that people the presence of God is near when a genuine prophetic word is given. When, you, when a genuine prophetic word is given, it is fueled by the presence of God, and people will feel that. Now, how do you know a prophetic word is from God? So, Paul lays down kind of like these structures to make sure that people hear correctly by saying there's going to be multiple people who will be given the word of God and there'll be a community where people can kind of validate this word. And that's the thing with prophetic word nowadays, you know. Prophetic word needs accountability because I, I realize nowadays people will just say, oh, I have a prophetic word. I hear from God and this is what I feel like God is saying to you. One, I, I agree that when people phrase it like that, this is what I feel God is saying to you, right? Because the reality is, 
we can hear wrong. Anyone and everyone can at times hear wrong. For instance, you, I could hear something from God for someone. And when I approach that person, I say, hey, this is, what I think, this is what I feel God is saying to me about you. And you can either confirm or deny, but this is what I feel. And this is a thing. Sometimes she will say, that's wrong. And that's okay. Because I know some people get so discouraged by the fact that what if I get it wrong? Um, and feel like you're blasphemy and then God's going to condemn me. Well, one, if you're speaking blasphemy, you can, you'll know because if it's contradictory to the word of God. That's one. But two... Just because you heard wrong doesn't mean God's angry. But that's an invitation to try your best to hear even more. Because the deeper your relationship with God, the clearer, clearer you'll be able to discern His voice. And a lot of time, if you're not reading this, then you'll most likely not be able to discern His voice. So st st step three is this. Read your word. Because His word gives you the ability to hear Him in I guess live time life. If you're not leaning the word, then you'll never be able to truly discern his voice. And then what Paul lays out is this. Paul is laying out that there's this community of pe people that are able to vouch for one another or check one another. And that's the thing with prophecy. Uh, especially when I have like say like let's have to make an important ministerial decision. What I, what uh, a strategy that. I'm impl trying to implement consistently. And um, I learned is when we pray for a word from the Lord, um, have multiple people pray on the same thing. And if there's a there's a, a lineup, then you know that it's from the Lord as long as it doesn't contradict the word of God, right? As long as it doesn't contradict the word of God and it lines up with multiple people, then you can believe that, you know, this is from the Lord. When we start prophesying without accountability, that leads to abuse or, or corruption, whether done intently or, un, un, or inadvertently. And so Paul's saying, if you're going to do this prophetic thing, this prophetic ministry, which he encourages and he says you should, don't make this a one man or one woman show. But do this as a, a community so that you can be checked because this is the thing. People can hear wrong. From lay people to leaders, everyone and anyone can hear wrong. That's why you need a community to cross-check one another. And so Paul's talking about this orderly worship where he says, this is how we're to prophesy. This is what we're not to reflect. We're not to reflect the earthly religions. Um, again, not forbidding tongues because he again, he blatantly says at the end, do not forbid it. Let people, it is a genuine gift of God. Right? And as it goes down, then the issue that some people need clarif clarification is verse 34. And verse 34 says, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission and if you keep going, it, it seems to be that Paul is very anti-woman. Well, Paul isn't. If you read the totality of his letter and if you read any of his works, you realize Paul's not anti-woman. Or this is not about men being better. But he's saying in this particular context that we should not disrupt the flow of worship. And let me explain. When he says women should remain silent, he doesn't mean that women can't be leaders and women cannot prophesy because early in the letter, there's a full expectation for women to lead and prophesy in that realm and context. So what is Paul saying? Because the word woman, it's very, it's an umbrella term in English, but in the original Greek, it may it's a very specific. It can be a very specific group of people, and you have to look contextually as to what that means. A lot of times, women can be the un in this, the context, and the biblical word in the Greek can mean young women who are unmarried, and just women who are widowed or people who are not attached to any male figure. That's just the bare definition of that. I know in the English, it seems all women, it's not. 
Paul's addressing a particular specific group. And he's saying, what is going on in this situation at this church is that uh, not just women, but he's talking about people in general, that there's this disruption in the flow of service. And that there should, there's a right time and right place for everything. And what was going on in the Corinthian church was that in this particular instance and context, these young women were going around and disrupting the, the service. And when they're disrupting service by saying, asking questions in service. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking questions, but there's a time and place. So when, let's say, for instance, when I'm speaking on a, on a Sunday service, I'm not saying you shouldn't have questions. But me speaking during a Sunday service is not necessarily the best time to ask questions. There's a time afterwards. There's email. There's face-to-face -face conversation, personal conversation. If I open it up for Q&A, then yes. But generally during a service, we're just trying to hopefully I explain what, I, what I'm saying thoroughly but if there's a question that we have small groups that we have times outside of service to clarify and so that's what Paul's addressing is this state of worship in the Corinthian church where people in general were disrupting the flow of it and he's trying to say okay this is what we need to one we need to not look like everyone else because that's not giving us our Christian identity and it's distracting us from our true purpose of Christianity. It's not to be a religion that is ecstatic and spiritual looking, but that we are spiritual by our relationship to Christ. And then secondly, he's saying, if there's even questions during the sermon or the, the service, when someone gives a prophetic word, to save your questions for a later time. Because what's going on is also... Not so much the sermon as well, but when people are prophesying, people were saying, hey, what are you saying? Explain to me. I'm confused. Or some people were, the situation in in the studies and the, what the scholars are saying, that some people were saying, oh, your prophecy is not right. And causing this confusion and division in the community. And so therefore, Paul is laying out this system where worship in of itself will not be divisive or delayed or confusing but that it will be orderly for the building up of the faith in the community and also reaching out to non-believers by not reflecting the t the religious systems of the day and so the ba the premise of today's passage is the idea of what can we do to show even in the orderliness of our worship, our relationship to God. And it's not about anti-women or women's roles per se. It's not about anti-spiritual gifts, but it's doing what we can to prioritize, even within our service, the gospel and our relationship with God. So hopefully that's clear. Um, if it's not, uh, you can always reach out to me. You can find resources on the internet. Um, and also the Spirit of God. Meditate on it. Sit with it. And that's the thing. If there's something in the Bible that agitates you or you may quote unquote disagree, those are perfect invitations from the Spirit to come sit with Him so He can talk to you. All right, let me pray for us. Lord, we just thank you for this day. It's a new week. And Lord, we need new graces to continue forward. So bless us, bless my brothers and sisters, and all those who uh, see this video to continue to walk in your spirit, Lord. In Jesus' I pray, amen. Be blessed.